for such a time as this. How many of you guys are clock watchers? Get any clock watchers in here? Yeah, you're not admitting it right now, are you? But you know during the service you're going to be checking them cell phones and them watches, seeing how long is this preacher boy going to preach up here, a little whippersnapper up here trying to preach. And, and some of you are going to, you look at the, the clock during work day, right? Anybody else do that? Uh huh. Okay, what, is it time to go home yet? Amen. All right, so we got some clock watchers. Now, how many of you all like to be on time? Anybody like to be on time? Y- y'all say you like to be on time, but... Service starts at 10.30, and half y'all don't get here until about 10.45, amen? So anyway, but, but anyway, we love you. And so, uh, but how many of you all are always late wherever you go? I'll be late to my own funeral one day, there's no doubt about it. They're going to start the service, and I'm going to walk in and lay down, amen? I, I just, I don't know, man. I just ain't got it in me. Paige gets on me all the time, and, and I don't care what anybody says. She tries to keep me running ahead, but I'm a lot like that Brad Paisley song, I'm just waiting on a woman. Amen? Anybody else left there? <laughs> waiting on three. <laughs> Amen. So we got some clock watchers, we got some people who are on time, and we got some people who run late like Brother Brian does on a Sunday morning. Amen? So everybody deals with time. I don't know about you all, but to me and in my life, there's been good times and there's been bad times and there's been sorrow times and there's been happy times. There's been tough times and rough times, celebration times and crying times. I've had a lot of times in my life, and I'm sure you all have too. See, we deal with time in everything we do. We deal with the time we go to work, the time we spend with our kid, the amount of time we spend with the Lord, or the amount of time we spend waiting in line at Garcia's on a Sunday afternoon, amen. There's time in everything we do in life. But one of the most important times that we're going to have is the time that we spend with the Lord. And we're going to talk about that this morning, amen. For such a time as this. For such a time as this. So we have all sorts of times. Minutes, hours, seconds. We had that one time at church camp and the one time at band camp, amen? We got all sorts of times that come up in our life. But this morning, I'm not talking about that time. This morning, I want to bring to your attention three times. Three times that I feel that are very vital and very pivotal in the movement of the church today. And if we will come to the understanding of what God has to say to us this morning, I really believe that change can take place. And you say, Daniel, what's wrong? Things are going good. Man, things are fantastic. Hallelujah. We've seen over 600 salvations. Amen. Last Sunday night, we baptized 15 people into God's baptismal pool down at Green River Lake. Amen. We continue to see the house full every week, so God is blessing. And just because your church may not be growing doesn't mean that God's not blessing. It just means you're in a different time. But can I tell you something this morning? Things are great, but things can always get better. Hallelujah. We want just a little bit more. And so for such a time as this, if you would, I'm going to ask you to turn with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers is a book in the Bible that's full of a bunch of letters. First service didn't get it either. I thought it was funny. Amen. (laughs) Preachers are never as funny as they think they are. I guess that's why God called us to preach and not tell jokes. Amen. (laughs) Numbers 13. We're going to start in verse 1. At least y'all laughed a little bit. Amen. Don't shoot me down. All right. Numbers chapter 13. We're going to start in verse 1. Now, I'm just going to tell you this morning, Elkhorn. I am, man. I'm excited to share this word. And when the Spirit gets a hold of you, sometimes you just got to go. But I'm here to tell you this morning, this is a lot of scripture, but if you will stay with me, there is something so powerful in this this word this morning. So Numbers chapter 13, we're going to start in verse 1, and it says, The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send out one of its leaders. So at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and on into the hill country. See what the land is like and whether the people who live there, are they strong or are they weak? Are they few or are they many? What kind of land do they live in? Is it good land or is it bad land? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or are they fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or is it poor? Are there trees in it or not? 
and do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. See, he wanted, he wanted just a little bit of the taste of what was to come. Amen? Well, this morning we're going to give you a taste of what is to come. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. Verse 21 says, So they went up and they explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Lebo Hamath. Now, I can't pronounce these words. I'm just going to be honest, and you can't either. Amen? So, But we're going to read them anyway. They went up through the Negev. I don't know why in the world the Lord just didn't use Bob, Jim, John, and Joe. Amen? That would have been a whole lot simpler, but whatever he wanted to do. So here we go. So Lebo Hamath, and they went up through the Negev, and they came to Hebron, where Ahiman, Shishai, and Tamay, the descendants of Enoch, lived. When they reached the valley of Eshcol, say Eshcol. Amen, all right. They cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them along with some pomegranates and figs. That place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites had cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. So let's stop there just for a second. So we look, and we got Moses and the Israelites, and they're hanging out, and they're chilling out in the desert. Cool place to hang out. That's definitely where I want to go is to a desert. Amen? I don't know about you all, but I have been to a dry period in my life. Anybody else ever been there? I shared this morning that one of the hardest times I ever came to in my life, and I've had a few. I know I'm a young whippersnapper to a few, but I've been preaching for almost 13 years now. God called me when I was 13, so do the math. And so the thing is, is... Um, when God called me and, 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 and I thought, man, things are going to be good, little did I know that there would be times in my life to where I would pray and it felt like my prayers were bouncing off the ceiling and slapping me back in the face. Little did I know that there would be Sunday mornings, even as a pastor, that I would sit in a seat during worship and listen to a man of God proclaim the Word of God and not even feel moved. Little did I know that even as a man of God, as a pastor, that I would sit in a seat sometimes and not feel like worshiping my Lord. Anybody else ever been there? Yeah. Amen. See, we're very open and transparent because the thing is, you cut us, we bleed. We're just mortal men. We serve the same God you are, and we love to worship Him, but we're just human like you. And we want you to know that just because pastor or brother or reverend or doctor or whatever may be in front of our name, we are human. Amen. And so I've sat there before and songs have come up and I'm just thinking, man, I'm ready to go. What time is it? Is it time to go eat? I need to be out on the lake. I've got places I need to go. I've got a thousand things I've got to get done. I don't want to be here. I have been in a desert time. Amen. And I'm sure many of you all have as well. So they're in the desert waiting for the response because God told Moses to send out the leaders to go and look at the land that God had prepared. I don't know about you all, but I know that God's got something a whole lot better than anything we could ever have down here. Amen. Y'all listening, young people? You can't listen if you're on your phone. So God has something so much better for us prepared. And he said, I want you to go look at it and bring back a little bit about what it has. Bring it back and let me see it. And so he sent them out and he said, come back. He finds Moses and them and they're standing in the desert. Now I don't know where you are in your life this morning, but I would bet to say that there's somebody in this house this morning who's in the desert. Your relationship's falling apart. You find yourself tipping back the bottle again, smoking that joint again. You find yourself doing things that you said you would never go back to and you're in a desert time this morning. You feel like that you can't worship the Lord anymore. You feel like you've lost your, your cries and your tears and your prayers. You don't, you don't remember remember the last time you stood up and praised the Lord for what he did for your family but hallelujah you're sure quick to call on him when you're sick and dying amen see the thing is is we come to a point in our lives as Christians where we get a dry spot and when we get dry we want water we know the water's there but we don't feel like walking any farther to get it amen Whew. all right praise your Lord hallelujah so anyway they're in the desert they come back to Moses, and they're giving the report to Moses. And here's what they say. Check this out. We went into the land into which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Who would have thought? Who would have thought? 
God did what he said he was going to do. I don't know about you all, but to me, that's not breaking news. Hallelujah. If God said he's going to heal the land, hallelujah, he'll heal the land. If God said he's going to heal you of cancer, why are you questioning it? Amen. He's going to heal you. But the people who live there are powerful. And the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Enoch there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Mosquito Bites, and the Chigger Bites. Y'all still with me? Okay. They all live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea along the Jordan. And I love Caleb. Hold up, he said. Hey, hey, hold up. Now, I don't know about you all. Does anybody have anybody in your life that's negative all the time? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know nobody in here ever posts anything negative on Facebook because we would never see anything like that, right? Much of church-going people. Anyway, so there, but we have negative people in our life, right? In our churches, in our businesses, in our families, negative people. They never see the good God gives them. Amen? You know, this week, and, and I know she knows, and, and I'm not tr- calling her out, but we, we were talking this week, and Paige said, I'm just overwhelmed. There's a lot going on. I said, honey, I know you're overwhelmed, but praise God that we have good health. Praise God that we have a church that we can go to and worship. Praise God we have vehicles to drive. Praise God we have food in our belly. Amen. And you know, sometimes you can either see the bad things or you can see the good things. It's all in how you look at it. Amen. And so what had happened is they come back and they were given a bad report. And Caleb says, hold on just a minute. Hold up. Hush up. Whew. Let me talk just for a second. I love Caleb's heart. He says, we should go up and take possession of that land. But we can certainly do it. And I think sometimes in our lives we know that God has got something so much better. And we got so many naysayers around it. Why are you praying and going to church? Ain't nothing but a bunch of loud hippies out there at Elkhorn. They just jumping and dancing and preaching and praising all the time. Yeah, we hear it all the time. It's all good, whatever. And, and, and so we have people speaking death over us when in all reality we need people speaking life over us. Amen. And so Caleb stands up and he says, hold on just a minute. I see. I see what's out there and I want it. I want it. And I think we should go take it. So Elkhorn, this morning, I know that revival is going to fall in this house. I know it's still yet to come. We just got to go get it. Amen. I see it. I see it. It's right out there. We just got to go get it. That's right. Sometimes you just got to get up and go get it. That's a good word. We may preach on that next time. All right. Hallelujah. But the men who had gone with him, now here we go. So we already had naysayers. Caleb says, let's go get it. And here's what their response is again. We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. They have a bigger church. They have more cars in their parking lot. They own more cars than we do. Then we think about our personal lives and we're like, well, how come they have more than we do? How come they have a boat and we don't? How come we work really hard and God didn't provide for this? Right? We start looking and we start saying, why did God give somebody something when they didn't earn it and he's not giving it to me? And we don't look at everything else that God has already given us. People used to come in the funeral home all the time, man. I'd open that door for them. Good afternoon. How are you? I could be better. And I'm thinking, yeah, and you could be worse. You could be laying up there, punk, you know. <laughs> Good day. Come in, complain. Could be better. Yeah, you're right. And you could be to the point where you couldn't even walk up in here. You could be cancer-stricken in a bed, not able to move. You don't, you don't look at that, though. So, church, I'm telling you this morning, it's not that I'm here to attack you, not that I'm here to come down on you, because that's not this kind of sermon at all. But, hallelujah, can I tell you something? God has something so much better than what we can imagine. But it's just like I said, well, to go, we just got to go. No matter what naysayer may rise up against us. All right, got to keep pushing forward. Verse 31. And, and so, so we're telling us, they got to attack these people. And the Israelites spread a bad report about the land that they had explored. They said... The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. They were scared. They were scared. Anybody in here struggling with fear this morning? Amen. You got a giant in your life, no matter if it's a person or a circumstance. And that giant 
is dictating your worship this morning. But can I tell you something? There may be some naysayers saying, oh, hold up now, think about it just a little bit. Let's use a little bit of common sense before we go do all this. No, it's called faith, hallelujah. The land we explored, the vows that were living in it, and they saw people of great size. We saw the Nephilim. They were the descendants of Enoch. We seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we definitely look the same to them. I'm telling you this morning, Elkhorn, there is a dry spell in everyone's life. Each and every one of us are going to go through a dry spell. Each and every one of us are going to have a point in our life to where we don't feel like praising. There's going to be a point in your life to where you don't feel like praying. There's going to be a point in your life to where you don't feel like getting up and coming to church on Sunday morning. So you lay in bed that Sunday. Next thing you know, it's the next Sunday and the next Sunday and the next Sunday. And before long, you don't even see anymore because you were not getting up. But then something goes wrong and you call 789-2113 and you want to talk to the pastor. Hey, would and me, amen. And so then, everything, all of a sudden, you want God right back in it, but you haven't put the effort forward to go after Him. A desert time is here, and if you're not in it now, you're going to go through it one day. Ronnie Sivils was the pastor I grew up under for most of my life as a child and as a teenager at Southside Baptist Church in Princeton, Kentucky. Brother Ronnie always preached in cowboy boots. He's a little bit short, fat, bald guy, and he preached in cowboy boots. I found that amusing. And so, but he preached a good word. He was solid, and he didn't back down from the truth. He didn't fluff people's ears to make them hear what they wanted to hear. He told them the God-honest truth from the Bible. Amen. I appreciate that. But he always said this. He said, you're either coming through it, you just got out of it, or you're in it right now. And that's the same thing with the desert spot. If things are looking good right now in your family, that's fantastic. But hang on, because you're getting ready to come back into something. Well, you're speaking death. No, I'm not speaking death. I'm just saying how life works out. But what I'm saying is this. All of us in this building this morning, all of us, are have or are in right now a desert time. We deal with time all the time. But this time, we're in a desert time. But can I tell you about something? There's something a little bit better than the desert time. Amen? It's called decision time. It's a decision time. This is where it gets pivotal. This right here is what's going to make the difference in our lives this morning. There comes a point in every church's life and every Christian's life to where we have to say, you know what? I'm not going to do what I used to do. I'm not going to be the same as I used to be. I'm tired of that same old junk. I'm tired of all that stuff that's holding me back. And I'm going to praise the Lord whether anybody else does it or not. Hallelujah. I'm going to get up and raise my hands whether anybody else raises their hands or not. There comes a decision time. And Brother Brian said it this morning better than anybody else could have. He said this. A decision will send you to heaven or a decision will send you to hell. That's how important decisions are. And so Elkhorn, I am encouraging you under the unction of God this morning to make a decision today that we are going into a true revival, hallelujah, starting in the heart of Kentucky so it can spread out all over the place. But we have to decide what we're going to do. This morning we've got to decide who we're going to serve. Choose this day whom you will serve, Elkhorn. Choose this day. See, I think we got a lot of people that's filling the seats on Sunday morning. We don't see them the rest of the time. Well, don't preach to me. I come to church on Sunday morning, put in my offering. Well, praise God. Hallelujah. What else are you doing for him? The devil's here on Sunday morning. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday too. In fact, he's probably sitting next to some of you this morning. He's whispering in some of your ears because some of you are so distracted. Because I said something previously that's already messed you up and you ain't heard the rest of the sermon that I've talked about. Or maybe worship's already messed you up and you can't focus. Maybe it's a phone, maybe it's paper rattling, or something else. See, that's the thing. We get so caught up on the, our attendance that we forget about where our heart is. Can I tell you this morning, church, that we have something that God gives us called power. And God's power is full of mightiness. It is so strong. It is so big. And it is full and ready for us to take. How many of you all say that you have the power of God in your life? Amen? Anybody in here got the power of God? Really? If you don't have your hand up, can I tell you that you have the power of God? Everybody in here has the power of God in your life. Something you may not have to make that power work is called faith. Power is only as good as the faith is behind it. 
God gives us the power to do things. We have the power to raise people from the dead. I know some religious fanatics don't think that, but they do. It's okay. Hey, it's all right. I wasn't taught about people raising from the dead until I started going to Elkhorn five years ago. My church never taught about it when I grew up. In fact, they never taught on tongues. They never taught on healing or anything like that. So it's okay if you're a little flipped out. I was too. All right? But I'm telling you, it's real. You know why I know it's real? Because God healed my back, and I've been able to sleep ever since then. Praise God. But we have the power to raise people from the dead. We have the power to, to lay hands on them. It's not that the power is us. If I lay my hands on Bobby, it's not that Daniel healed Bobby. It's that God healed Bobby through me. But see, the only way that power can work is if we have faith that will back it up. People come in all the time and they want to tell us about their problems, talk about their problems. This and that and everything else. And then they like to post it all over Facebook and Twitter and everything else. Even sometimes get on topics and talk about it on there too. But the thing is, is this. You have the power to take care of it. You just got to have the faith to back it up. It's funny, we trust God to save our souls, but God can't fix our marriages. We trust God to save our souls, but he can't heal our land. We trust God to save our souls, but he's not going to take us away from the addiction that we've got. How do we put faith in God to save us, but not faith in God to do anything else? Where's the faith at? This morning, it's a decision time here at Elkhorn Baptist Church. This morning is a pivotal moment because this morning, you're going to have to make a decision on who you're going to serve, how you're going to serve, and when you're going to start. If you would, turn with me to Numbers 14. I've got just a little bit more scripture. I'm, I promise, I'm almost done. I really am. Numbers 14, it says, That night all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. Then they went home, posted it on Facebook, sent out texts to the beauty shop girls, got on topics and talked about it. That I didn't really read that. I was just making sure y'all was paying attention. It did say they grumbled, though, and sometimes that sounds like a church. Amen. And so they said they grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, and here we go. See, you notice what happened. A couple went in grumbling, and then they all started to grumble. They all started. You know, I love the fact that we have the opportunity to pastor, but we protect our sheep. You're not going to call and come in here and start a ruckus, amen? If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Why am I sick? Why do I never feel good? Blah, 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 blah. Why? Why isn't God providing? Why isn't food falling from heaven? I went to church last Sunday morning. <clears throat> morning. Why isn't God providing for me? It's, it's a hard word, but it's, I'm telling you, right now it's decision time. Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? Mm. <laughs> a lot of people want to take a step back. They do. Some people don't even like coming to church on Sunday morning. Some of you may not come back after this morning's message, and that's okay. People don't like being around the Lord. It makes them uncomfortable. Some people don't like the fact that they get to see people healed. People stand up, been in a wheelchair, and walk. They don't like the fact that they see 250 meals delivered on a Monday evening. They don't like the fact that 450 people, including students and children, fill this place on a Wednesday night. They don't like that. It makes them uncomfortable. They don't like the fact that they get to sit down one-on-one -on -one with a young child and say, Jesus loves you. They don't like that. So instead of just dealing with it, they begin to grumble and mumble and cause a ruckus. 
And then it causes confusion. But can I tell you something? No matter what happens, we have to make the decision this morning where we're going to stand. Skip on down. Let's start in verse 5. And it says, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly. Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of, I'm assuming this is Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes. Say, tore their clothes. Tore their clothes. And said to the entire Israelite assembly, and this is power right here, I speak this. The land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. Amen. If the Lord is pleased with us, He will lead us. Amen. He will lead us into that land. A land that is flowing with milk and honey. And will give it to us. Amen. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not be afraid of the people of the land. Because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. See, there's a desert time. And for many of your all's lives, you're in a desert time. Things are messed up. You're really unhappy with the circumstances that you're in. Things are going on at home and at work and at church, and you are messed up. I've been there. I've had some rough stuff just because... Brothers in front of the name doesn't mean everything's a cakewalk. Stuff happens every day and every week that messes me up. But what happened is a decision time comes just like this morning to where something has to happen that becomes pivotal for the rest of the walk. When those guys brought forth the good stuff from the land and everybody else was the naysayers and no, we can't do it three times, they said, no, we can't do it. We can't go back. That land is scary. They will kill us. They're bigger than we are. Can I tell you something? Elkhorn, we don't need to have fear of what is to come. Because God is going to lead us into a land of milk and honey. So from the desert time that we're in right now, stay with me, comes the decision time that we're going to make this morning which will open our third time that we're going to discuss called deliverance time. Before we can be delivered, we have to make a decision to get out of the desert. I deal with teenagers on a weekly basis, around 150 or so. I constantly, I hear... I'm just so tired of my circumstances. I'm tired of mom and dad fighting. I'm tired of going back to the same old stuff. I'm so tired of just the normal norm. So tired. Because they're in a desert time. And they, they want to be delivered, but they have to make the decision, and so do you. Because if you're tired of the circumstances of where you are, and you don't like where you are, then this morning, church, make the decision to be delivered into something better. Amen? If you notice in Scripture, once Joshua and Caleb grabbed their clothes and they tore them, and once Moses and Aaron fell face down on the ground in front of the Lord, if you'll notice what happened, here's what Scripture says. The Lord appeared to the people. Can I tell you something this morning, Elkhorn? When we come to the point as a church that we say, absolutely no more. I'm going to rip off my flesh. I'm not going to serve this world anymore. Hallelujah. I'm going to fall face down before the Lord and praise His name. Then the Lord shall appear and fire shall fall from heaven. Amen. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else likes it. I like it. Hallelujah. It's all right. If your feet are hurting, I was aiming at you hard. It's okay. I'm telling you, no matter what kind of desert time, no matter, no matter what kind of time you're in right now, finances aren't where they need to be. If booze is a problem, drugs are a problem, something's going on in the marriage and it's getting rocky, somebody done up and left, can I tell you something this morning? Hallelujah. You can be delivered from all that, but you have to make the decision to come forward and get it. 
I can offer you something all day long, but until you decide you're going to take it, it's not going to do any good. For I stand at the door and knock. Amen. He's standing at the door this morning. He's saying, hey, I got something for you. He's like the UPS man this morning. Hallelujah. I got something good for you this morning, but you got to come get it. But if you refuse to, I'm just going to take that package and walk back to my truck. Now, how many of you all this morning want something better from the Lord? Amen. How many of you this morning want to be delivered from something in your life? Can I tell you that it's here this morning. Make the decision that you want to be delivered this morning and be set free. But it has to come to a point to where you tear your clothes and you fall face down in front of the Lord. 